when when uh, um, when we initially conceived of this event, the thought was that um, uh, the judge and I could sort of take the moderator's privileges um, to reflect a bit on the conversations of the morning and also chat about broader themes that either have emerged or that we didn't get to talk about in enough detail. Um, I guess, Judge, I'm curious, I mean, you sat through a lot of other people talking this morning. Um, and I'd love to hear sort of your reaction to what you think is, you know, different about your job as a judge today versus when you came on the bench. Those differences, good or bad, what would you change? Well, it's a great, I was thinking about it as I was listening um, to the, um, the, your panel, uh, because when uh, I, 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 came, I came to the judiciary through uh, local government and um, working as uh, chief counsel at the FAA in Washington, and um, uh, uh, I was very fortunate that I, w uh, I was approved by the Senate by unanimous consent. Uh, as opposed to what's going on now, where it's 49 to 51, or 49 to 50, or 50-50, and then the the vice president has to break the tie. So, um, uh, and there were no. I, I, I was nominated by uh, President Clinton, but I always described it as being uh, that I was recommended by Daniel Patrick Moynihan and then nominated by President Clinton, because that's the political process. But Senator Moynihan had a, a very even-handed view of how to select judges. And he had a committee uh, that he listened to and chose from people who were recommended. And there were several people recommended for a particular judgeship. What we have now is a, a much more tr partisan, troubling partisan arrangement where the public believes that if you were nom if you were appointed by President Clinton, uh, you're a Clinton judge. If you were appointed by uh, President Trump, you're a Trump judge, and so forth. And I think that that uh, the problem of handling cases in that environment has become uh, uh, very, very difficult. And in large courts like mine, where we have 15 uh, uh, judicial slots, plus we have many uh, senior judges, your chances of having a case um, assigned to me are not that great. And if you file a case in the Eastern District of New York, it is, you know, likely since there are at least 25 judges at any given moment, uh, there's a, what, a 4% chance that you're going to get Garifus. But the public has this perception that if the case goes to, to me, I'm a Clinton judge. And I think that that's, it's unfortunate for the, for the country because it creates a false perception about how judges are selected to handle cases and, uh, and whether those judges have a preconceived notion about the cases they handle. I have hundreds and hundreds of cases, civil cases, at any one moment. And each case needs to be dealt with on its own merits. So uh, that's how I perceive the job of, of being a judge. But there is a false narrative that has sprung up about the motives of judges and the motives of, uh, of uh, uh, plaintiffs and defendants, and it's undermining the, it's not just a problem of the Supreme Court, it's a problem of all the courts that there's this perception that is now, has now crept into the public domain that there are preconceived notions and the judges will make decisions based upon their political philosophy or their uh, religion or their, um, uh, their, their, where, they went to, where they went to law school. So that's a real concern that we have now. 
Uh, and I think that, that uh, the question of nationwide injunctions, you know, is, is, it's linked to all of this. Uh, and and that's a, that, that, that concerns me. So I, I guess uh, at the risk of, of pushing back gently, um, it does seem to me that although I can think of, and I'm sure you can think of, a large, large, large number of judges for whom that appellation is unfair, um, there are at least more than zero federal judges in the country today who seem to um, be somewhat predictable in their rulings based upon broad ideological generalizations, who certainly at least parties seem to expect to be predictable based on filing patterns. Um, and so I guess my question is, is it possible that at least the perception that not all judges are as um, well-selected and even-handed um, has enough support in the real world that that's going to make it harder and harder to disabuse folks of this, of this vision, of this view? I think that's absolutely true. And, and that's a recent uh, development, I think. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate uh, because the public doesn't know about all of the decisions that a particular judge makes. And if there's a focus on one particular decision, and then that decision acts as the emblem for that, for that particular judge, that's the judge's philosophy. Uh, in most cases, it's a misnomer. But what's happening now is that uh, because of the way judges have been selected recently and because of the way Congress has handled the, the uh, confirmation process, there's a particular uh, tendency to, to conflate uh, a, a judge's um, a judge's experience, whether it's as a prosecutor, as a state judge, uh, as a uh, public official in a state, uh, with the judge's um, preferences on how to judge cases. And so I think it's an open question for each new judge as to whether they're going to follow some sort of philosophical um, bent or whether they're going to decide cases based on precedent, which is important for some of us, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, um, and the facts of the case. And, and the, the, the latter is the way to do it because it's the only fair way to do it. But there are claims that, that some judges uh, you know, are there to, to push an agenda. And which is unfortunate for the, you know, the thousand federal judges, you know, who, who work very hard every day to try to get it right. So I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit sort of biased myself in this respect. Um, as, as you know, I think some of the folks in the room know, right, there has been this effort by the Justice Department to push back against some of the judge shopping in Texas, um, right, where there have been motions to transfer cases filed in some of these single judge divisions where there was no obvious reason why the case should be in that particular division versus others. Um, and I, I will confess, I've been struck that, so there have been three, I think, published opinions by district judges rejecting these DOJ motions to transfer. And, and I've been struck, not by the results of those decisions, I think, you know, it's DOJ had an uphill battle, but at least in two of the three, the rhetoric really confounds me. Um, and I, I, Those are district I, judges who yeah. are rejecting motions motion to, transfer. To, to transfer. That's right. And so, so I'll just summarize. I, 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 I assume not everyone in the room has read these decisions, uh, which is to say I assume no one in the room has read these decisions. But so um, the, the, two, the two of the judges, Judge Tipton in Victoria, Judge Kazmarek in Amarillo, didn't just reject the motions to transfer, but were sort of offended that DOJ would even ask. Um, and basically went out of their way to sort of call into question um, the whether DOJ was even acting in an ethically appropriate manner by seeking to transfer these cases, um, and really took a very hard line view that by seeking by moving the transfer, DOJ was basically trying to impugn the integrity of these judges without saying so. And, and I'll just say I, I was struck in those opinions 
by the inability of both of those judges to differentiate between the public appearance of the litigants' behavior, right, which is to say the fact that the state of Texas was singling out these district courts, was bringing these cases to these district courts, and was admitting on the record that they were doing it in order to draw these judges from sort of an attack on the judge himself, right? Um, you know, I guess my question is, you're the one who's, who's been a, who is a federal judge. I, I'm not. Um, is, it, is, it just, is it harder than those of us who have not been on the bench appreciate to differentiate between the cases where the bad behavior is by the parties, right, and the cases where the bad behavior you feel like is being attributed to you? We all like to think that we're going to do a, uh, a fair and impartial job of handling a case. But there will be times when we are um, uh, presented the, an alternative view based on maybe something we've already decided in another case, some comment we made from the bench, or something we've written, all right? And, and it happens. And, and, you know, I'm in my 24th year on the bench, uh, and uh, my colleague's been on for 29 years. I'm trying to make it <laughs> to 29. <laughs> and, but, and, and so we, 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 we've, got to, we've got to avoid having a thin skin about this. And I think that it's a, while, while we have the system that we have, and reforms are people are trying to make reforms in how the districts are structured in certain parts of the country. Um, but while we have the system that we have, it's going to happen more often than in the past that uh, litigants will try to maximize the chance that they will win in court. And so they go to certain courts, which have only one judge in a particular courthouse, and automatically they're before that judge. And so it, it, they're making a record. The record is, I don't, this judge, you know, has a history of deciding, you know, these controversial cases in a certain way, and I don't think I can get a fair hearing before that judge. And so uh, even if the judge in the end um, denies the motion for transfer, uh, it, 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 it puts the issue before the appellate court that the application was made. And the other thing it does is it tells the district judge that the, the, the parties are aware of something that the judge, if he, he or she is not um, uh, conscious of it, should be aware also. And it may be that someone wants a different judge from Judge Garifas. Uh, there are a lot of other judges on the Eastern District of New York. Um, if, if I think that my uh, impartiality could reasonably be questioned, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, 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 grant a motion to transfer the case to the wheel, all right? But I, I, I wouldn't want to be happy to just transfer the case to one colleague on the bench, potentially. Because then the other be side shop him. Because then that's judge shopping, yep. too. Yep. So there are a lot of different problems that exist right now in the way things are done. And I noticed that um, Reuters had a story recently um, um, on October 18th, 2023, uh, that the... Uh, the um, Judicial Conference Advisory Committee on Civil Rules is in the process of examining whether to address the issues that Senator Schumer um, uh, described having to do with um, these uh, single-judge uh, divisions in, in the federal courts in, in the state of uh, Texas. And there may be others as well in other places. But... Uh, I think that it's a question that, that uh, may need to be uh, vetted, and, and uh, the Judicial Conference may have to take, may, may take a position on it and make, an app, make a recommendation to Congress yeah. to change the law. Sure. And so Congress can change the law if it wishes to do so. 
So I, I, I actually would love to put this question to Judge Sands and Judge Martin, too. But I'll, I'll start with you since you're up here. Um, so you've been on the court for 24 years. I, I'm curious what changes you've seen um, in sort of litigation behavior by parties in, you know, behind the scenes sort of discussions among you and your colleagues, you know, not not obviously in any one case because you're usually presiding by yourself, but sort of do things feel differently today in your job than they felt when you started? It, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Uh, I do find that in, in, in that certain attorneys are much less um, um, respectful of the courts these days. Um, you know, I've had a few circumstances where you know, I, I haven't been able to have a, uh, a discourse with an attorney on a, uh, on, in, a, in an argument where the attorney wouldn't move on to something else, where the attorney wanted to reassert him or herself uh, because uh, uh, I suppose the attorney thought I, I didn't hear what he or she said, or they wanted to talk about what they wanted to talk about, but they didn't want to address a question that I had. And so there, there's, there's some of that. Uh, and, uh, but otherwise, um, uh, I think that the, the system works well and attorneys are generally respectful of the court. Uh, most, if not all of them, uh, when they get a, 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 an order to file something, they file it. And and uh, they they help us move cases along. So I'd say that uh, I've learned a lot in 24 years. But one of the things I've learned is that at least in our court in the Eastern District of New York and in the other federal courts in in uh, the, in the Southern District of New York uh, and other courts where I've been a visiting judge, which I have. I've been a visiting judge in the Middle District of Alabama. I've been a visiting judge in the District of uh, New Mexico and also in the in Eastern District of Louisiana. That that uh, the the uh, the uh, advocates uh, do a very creditable job of adhering to the proper decorum and providing the court with the kinds of uh, paperwork and um, advocacy that is helpful to the court. That's great. Um, so the, the, the animating principle for today was nationwide injunctions. And so I guess I want, uh, I think you're probably the only person in this room who's issued one. Um, unless, I, I think Judge Sands, right? We, I, I don't know if there was one that you could think of. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, um, back when you had cases, especially during the Trump administration, where you were asked to issue that kind of relief, I don't know if nationwide injunctions had become such a boogeyman yet in, in discourse. Um, I guess I'm curious, you know, can you only, walk? Yeah. Only, only, uh, the only problem I had was with, with some of the remarks that were made from the podium by um, Attorney General Sessions, who, who uh, criticized my, my, one of my decisions, claiming that it whatever he claimed. I, I don't want to repeat his claim because it wasn't true, but, um, uh, you know, he was very um, uh, critical and which is his right. He, you know, he's in the, he was a, uh, in the executive branch. He was the attorney general. He wanted to take issue with something. The place to take issue with it is in the appellate court, you know, and that's the most respectful way to take issue of it, with it. But, um, but since he, he he basically voted for me to be a judge, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against him. <laughs> um, this, this, I think this was not long after he criticized, I think, your colleague on the District of Hawaii. Um, and, well, and yeah. I thought that was the, the, the most unfortunate thing anyone could say. The idea, tell everybody what he said. I'm trying to remember all the details. I mean, well, I was, I was fixated on his lack of geographical knowledge, but um, I must be misremembering. Somebody on an island. Yes, somewhere. that one. Right. He no, said so somebody yeah. on an island somewhere yeah. did something. Yes. And and I said that was it. I said, you know, 
That's a state. <laughs> it's a state, and it's a state that I love to visit. So I, I took issue with the, the attitude that it was just an island somewhere. Right, right. Uh, well, and indeed, just that, that, that Article Three district judges in Hawaii somehow have less of an Article Three commission right. than, That's than right. right. Um, he also, I think, at one point referred to it as the island of Hawaii, which if you know Hawaii, the district court sits on Oahu, not on Hawaii. But that's, that's me being pedantic. Um, so I, I want to I give folks in the audience a chance to ask questions to you. But I guess I, I have one more, I guess, big question to you for now, which is um, a similar question to what I asked Judge Sands on our panel. Um, you see this from a very from a unique side. You, all these issues, right? The sort of the role of the courts, the the proliferation of these kinds of injunctions. You see from your perspective on on the bench. Um, what are we getting wrong? What are we not doing well? What and by we I mean you know those of us who are out in the public talking about these issues on a more regular basis. Those of us who are teaching students about these issues. If you could knock some sense into us, where would you start? Well, I don't know that I would start with you. <laughs> I, I would start with, with kids going to junior high school. And I taught in a junior high school, and I taught in a high school. Kindergarten. Uh, well, kindergarten, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> but, but, but in the middle school, in the high school, and in college, the idea of teaching civics has, has, has disappeared, I think. And, and uh, young people are not, do not many of them do not understand what the role of, of, of government writ large and the courts in particular really is. And so they're listening, they're, 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 they're checking their Twitter feeds, they're, they're, uh, they're on Facebook, um, they're, and they're not, a, a, and they don't have the foundation to be critical about what they hear and read. And I think that makes it so much easier for advocates, and I'm using that term in the, the, the most broadest sense, uh, uh, that uh, people with, a, with a, 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 an agenda, if you will, that they, they are, th those people are taking advantage of the lack of uh, foundation on how government works. Uh, to, to shape public opinion. And so that's a real big problem. I taught, in a, I taught um, uh, social studies in a junior high school, and we, we were teaching people about the, you know, the separation of powers. I know there was a discussion here about the separation of powers, but I still think there is a separation of powers, uh, it, whether it's writ written in the Constitution or it's just done. Okay, and and many people really don't they, they are are ignorant because they have never partaken in the education process to learn about civics and civic responsibilities and the importance of voting, uh, except as it would affect uh, these these interest groups. So, I I'm not so worried about college professors or law professors. Uh, or, or law school, uh, or the law schools. I'm concerned about uh, the place where people get their initial um, uh, contact with with public education, private education, and uh, learn about the rule of law. Seems like a good place to start. Um, so we have a few minutes, I think, for questions, comments, thoughts from the audience. Judge Martin, you've been very quiet today. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know if it's on. Great. I, I um, just want, wanted to take a minute to, you know, there, there are a lot of things that detract from the public uh, perception of the courts that I worry about all the time. Uh, but I have to say, you know, uh, you know, we've got some people here. I can't think of anything else you all could do to uh, tr try to get the truth out about the efforts that um, you know most judges make to give people a fair hearing. Uh, and and Professor Black, you know, I loved your book. We're going to talk about your book later today. 
uh, for those of you who can, can come. Was it 4.30? 4.30. Um, but I think it, it tells the story uh, better than I've seen it anywhere else. I, I feel like I kind of lived uh, part of that story about, you know, how, you know, some of the, these new practices that are being introduced are, are undermining uh, the public perception of the courts, and, and maybe rightfully so. <laughs> so um, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of things that can be done, but I think for now, I'd like to just recognize what you all are doing, Judge Garifuss, Judge Sams, uh, Prof Professor Black, to, to remind people of the uh, historic importance of the courts and the roles that they continue to play most places, you know, I, I've got, you know, so many friends that are judges and they're going to the sixth grade civics classes yeah. trying to uh, educate children about what role the courts are, are meant to play and can play. Uh, but that's, you know, it's a, there are a lot of people to educate. Can, can I just uh, mention that there's a program in the uh, Second Circuit which was uh, established by uh, 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 the late Chief Judge uh, uh, Bob Katzman uh, on civic education. And it's an ongoing project, it, bringing in high school students uh, and others into the courthouse, teaching them a, uh, a lesson about the, the role of the courts and, and other parts of the government. Um, and that needs to have a much broader um, distribution of activities beyond just, you know, the courthouse in, in Manhattan, and, and uh, uh, but it's a start. And it's, you know, Judge Katzman recognized that there is a, there's a deficit here, and that we need to fill the deficit and, and bring back the, 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 the youth to have an understanding of, um, of, of how the, the uh, uh, public, how the government works, how the courts work, what the purpose of all of this is. And um, fortunately, it's been going very well, but it needs to be augmented. I'll just say, I mean, and then I want to get to Jim's question, but I'll just say, it seems like you might, you might think you're hearing two conflicting ideas, right, from everything that's been said this morning. One about how problematic and troubling, right, things are in various places in the courts and one about how important the courts are. Um, I, I guess this to me is actually a circle that can be squared, um, but we don't spend enough time talking about squaring the circle, which is um, two things can be true, right? Our system can be set up in a way where perhaps more so than any other democracy, we depend upon a robust and um, well-regarded judiciary, right, to serve as a check against the tyranny of the majority but that partly to ensure that that's possible, the sort of the slide in public confidence in the courts and the erosion of public trust in the courts is actually very dangerous, um, right? Because even though for those who are frustrated by our courts today, right, for those who see um, uh, bad, from their perspective, decisions coming out of the courts, maybe weaker courts sound better to us Right? But actually, I think the, the tricky part is persuading and educating folks about why in the long term we actually need courts, um, even if not especially when they do things with which we disagree. But Jim's probably going to yell at me now. So, Jim. Oh, the, the, um, uh, there's a mic coming for you. There's, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Congress, so let me ask a magical gauge. All of us engage a little magical thinking. What if Congress did pass uh, some sort of North LaGuardia sort of Say, you know, you can issue an injunction here, but you can't there, and all that. But the Congressional Act, or even, call me even crazier, they passed a law that said the Supreme Court should have, like, a rule of ethics, right? Um, what do you think the chances are that the courts would obey it? So, I mean, I, I, I think one of the one of the many many things that I think was said on the on the last panel that I very much agree with. You know, Noah Rosenblum was talking about how in those prior moments in American history in which the political, well, in which Congress and the executive branch exerted leverage over the court, 
um, much of the leverage that was exerted was not direct, right? Much of it was the threat of further incursions, further inroads, further restrictions if the court didn't shape up, right? If the court didn't align, conform its behavior to whatever the loose expectation was. And so I guess, you know, Jim, my, my response to you is um, part, of this, part of the conditions that it will be necessary to make any meaningful congressional reforms effective is the specter that if the court ignores them, if the court strikes them down, the next generation of reforms will be even more aggressive, right? And so this is where I think, I mean, I'll just say, and I'm just speaking for myself here, I think what is unique about the moment we are in, and, and I think Professor Murray and I will talk about this a bit this afternoon, um, to me what makes the current moment unique is actually not the composition of the Supreme Court. Um, it's not the radicalism, to me, of some of its decisions. Um, it's the lack of accountability. Um, right, that we've we've had a six-three supermajority on the court before. We've had a court that was, you know, hostile to any number of progressive ideals in the past. We've had a court that was not especially wedded to precedent at various points in the past. What makes this moment unique to me is, in all those prior moments, the court was nevertheless receptive if and when there was sustained, coordinated pushback by the democratically elected branches. Um, whether you want to talk, whether we're talking about the early 19th century, Reconstruction, um, the turn of the 20th century, the 1930s. And the ethics, I mean, Jim, you mentioned, you mentioned the ethics piece of this. What, I, what strikes me about the ethics point is that this is a classic example of unaccountability, right? That, you know, we might not all agree on what the ethics rules for the justices ought to be. We might not even agree on who's best situated to adopt them. Um, but the notion that there just should therefore be no rules that no one can enforce against anybody um, doesn't really follow to me as a conclusion. And yet here we are. Um, when Justice Alito says to the Wall Street Journal, as he did in July, I, I couldn't believe this quote. When he said, um, you know, this, this, may be an un this may be a controversial position, he said, um, but I don't believe any provision in the Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate the court, period. Um, you know, there are four, just to be specific. But um, that aside, I mean, that mentality to me is the problem, right? The, the notion that, like, that's where we are. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not a judge. I don't see this from the inside. But from my sort of nerdy ivory tower law professor perspective, part of the story here is how do we build back up the idea that the Supreme Court ought to be accountable at least to the same degree that the lower federal courts are. Um, right, that, you know, the same rules that apply to Judge Garifuss that apply to Judge Sands that applied, and some, actually a couple still apply to Judge Martin, right, um, should also apply to the justices. And that really ought not to be a especially controversial proposition, and yet in 2023 it is. I would add that the, these rules are not particularly onerous, all right? <laughs> and and, and uh, we have help in finding our way through the uh, the uh, the rules and applying the rules to our behavior. Um, there's a codes of conduct committee that uh, that uh, the Article Three judges uh, um, can uh, uh, apply to for assistance, uh, and and uh, and we make uh, annual disclosures, uh, financial disclosures. So. Um, these these rules apply to all judges on the lower courts, and there are also rules that apply to all public officials in the federal government above a certain salary level, and and so and and they we manage thousands of people manage to live within the rules. So it's not a question of establishing onerous um, uh, requirements for for. Others, it's it's really a question of what's, you know, how can we show the public that we are acting appropriately in in our uh, positions, and we have a great deal of power um, collectively as judges, and I think it's important that we we provide the public with the kind of confidence that it should have that we are. We are following certain ethical guidelines 
uh, and financial guidelines. And uh, I would encourage this to be made more universal. Yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, the talk about ethics infuriates me, frankly, because it really applies to what judges do after work. I've, I've written an article titled, characteristically, after work be ethical. At work, being corrupt is fine. So all the judges that I had to deal with, they were all lower court judges. The Supreme Court, of course, you know, does not have the capacity to hear cases, so it didn't take my case. But what is the use of rules that do not guide the professional behavior, the behavior on the bench that does not, that do not create steps that a judge has to go through in arriving at the decision but merely say, oh, you know what, kind of show your taxes to the people. I mean, who gives a, you know, it, it, it just, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. If lower court judges can behave in an arbitrary manner, as, as I've witnessed, just simply falsifying parties' argument, you know, you kind of later on, you look at the decision and, you're, and you ask yourself, where did this come from? We didn't argue. They didn't argue. Why is this in the decision? Uh, if they can do that, what in the world is the use of ethical rules? All those judges are bound by ethical rules. And what's the use? So I'm just curious. Well, I'll just say, I mean, I, I th it seems to me that um, there is a difference between judges doing things that we think are substantively or procedurally incorrect and judges doing things that we think are motivated by um, uh, extraneous personal considerations. So, for example, when Justice Alito didn't recuse from a case the Supreme Court decided about Argentinian bonds, the result of which was to net, I think it was $3 billion um, for someone with whom he has a close personal relationship. Um, I, I think that one could agree or disagree with the logic of the Supreme Court's decision and still think that justices who have such an obvious personal financial stake in the case shouldn't be participating in it. So I will, I, I'll die on the hill that the ethics matter too, um, even if the point is that they're not the, the, the sum total of what matters in litigation. Um, I think, do we have time? I don't know if there's any more questions out there, but if not, um, Judge, thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Uh, Judge Martin, CCJ, thank you guys so much for all of today's festivities. And thank you all for coming and watching online and, and all the things you do. Um, now go educate the, the middle schoolers and the I'm, high schoolers. I'm on my way. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.